Okay, so I'm gonna, I've talked to uh, Harmeet a little bit earlier. I wanna do a really brief overview of uh, distal humerus fractures, next slide. And uh, so uh, distal humerus fractures are common enough. I think this is the realm of uh, upper extremity surgeons of traumatologists and even general surgeons if you recognize uh, what, you, what you're dealing with. So if we're looking at intraarticular distal humerus fractures, or common into supracondylar fractures, um, then there's a plating system that may be helpful for that. This uh, next slide. So if it's intraarticular, if it's displaced, if it's unstable, and these are more likely going to be surgical than your typical mid-shaft humerus fractures. Uh, fortunately, there's a variety of companies that have these pre-contoured, um, side-specific uh, fixation systems. Uh, Synthes is just one of them. Uh, um, at, um, and now I think there's a number of different companies. Next slide. So this allows you the versatility to address the different fracture patterns. Uh, there's a lot of experienced traumatologists in the room, so I look forward to their comments on this. But the controversy, of course, is the 90 uh, degree fixation or the 180 degree fixation. And I think you let the fracture pattern address that. Uh, and help guide you with that. Uh, the posterior lateral plate um, really acts as a tension band and you can get medial support that will allow you screw fixation to interdigitate and provide some fixation to that. Just make sure you have uh, articular congruence. New paragraph, or uh, ne next slide. Um, so the goal is anatomic reduction, stable fixation, the typical AO uh, principles, uh, preservation of blood supplies, to allow for early active range of motion because as I tell my patients, the elbow just doesn't take a joke very well. So prone to stiffness. And I think we all recognize that. Next. So you can do these prone, uh, you can do them uh, on the lateral. Uh, you could uh, do them uh, even supine by putting it over a table, um, dealer's choice, depending on your comfort. Uh, these two positions give you the opportunity to get a little traction on it. Next slide. Here's a typical approach. You know, the uh, utilitarian approach to the elbow gets you virtually everywhere you want to be. Pay attention to the uh, neurovascular anatomy to protect it. Next slide. So that last slide demonstrated a olecranon osteotomy. I think that works very well. Adds a little bit of complexity really gets you a good look, but if you're confident and there's not too much uh, comminution centrally, then uh, you don't have to take off the olecranon. You can certainly do it from a medial and lateral uh, approach. The goals are reduce the articular surface, determine length, and get stable fixation. You can uh, pre-reduce and stabilize with K-wires. Uh, next slide. You can contour the plates if you need to, but they're frequently really well contoured. Uh, out of the box I found. Um, next slide. So uh, again, fracture reduction, uh, make sure you have articular congruence, determine appropriate plate length. And here's an issue, make sure that the lengths are different uh, proximally so that you don't induce a stress riser, uh, more proximally uh, based on one side or the other uh, so that there's, there's not a concentration of force with equal length plates. Next slide. So uh, again, uh, here's some, an example of placing that poster lateral plate contrary. Next slide. And then do make sure that you have a uh, good fixation. Next slide. That poster lateral puts you to address the capitellar shear fragment as well. Um, now, if you, the, an alternative is a, is a uh, poster lateral plate without any support. Next slide. And then of course, depending on once you've got that other lateral side done, approach the medial side with the uh, medial plate and you see the two differential lengths of the plates as illustrated here, next slide. Uh, next slide, I'm gonna leave some time for, uh, for uh, discussion of the cases. And then here's a trick to get the screw just right. Next slide. Uh, and here's some alternatives, single or double, uh, locking or non-locking. I think we've often gone to locking plates. It's comfortable. 
but certainly the literature I think still supports this mostly for osteoporotic patients and non-locking plates are reasonable. Next slide. Uh, so for my first case, I have a 74 year old female. Um, she definitely has poor nutrition status. She's osteoporotic. She has a simple fall from standing height at home, but by definition, this is a pathologic fracture. She has pain and deformity and I see her in follow-up with a splint on. Next slide. And this is what she has. Next slide. But you see on the lateral view, there's significant displacement. Next slide. Next slide. And she did get a CT scan. Next slide. Looking for any extension of the fragment and the degree of comminution. And I recognize early on, there's a certain degree of comminution that gives me a little bit of concern about um, the stability of the construct. Next slide. And next slide. So this is the construct that I selected. I did have the opportunity to uh, appreciate just how soft her bone was, uh, but I probably under um, under appreciated it. And although I thought I got pretty good stable fixation and got her moving, next slide. Next slide, restored articular uh, congruence and Got her moving, but you see this, this is what's happening to her some weeks later. I find out later she's pushing off the chair. She's using her arms a great deal, but I can take some responsibility for not uh, protecting her from herself. Next slide. She also got low vitamin D, poor nutritional uh, intake. I have lengthy discussions with her, with her husband, who was actually quite supportive. We get her back on vitamin D supplementation. Uh, next slide. And then take her back to the OR and do what I should have done in the beginning, get some interdigitation of those screws, get better fixation. And this time I did select a 180 degree construct. Next slide. And next slide. And then she uh, went on to, uh, to heal pretty well. So I can back up that one if you don't mind, Bridget. And one more. So I'd invite the other experts in the room for any questions, comments, or suggestions. Mike. Yeah, here's, go, go ahead, ahead uh, Harmeet. Yeah, sorry. Um, why do you think it, uh, in, in your opinion, why do you think it failed the first time? So I don't think I got adequate stable fixation on the, her lateral column. Uh, I looked at the, the screws, I could have, extended it across the trochlea better. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, you know, poor carpenter blames his tools. I, I would look at her and say, I did not appreciate just how poorly compliant and nutritionally suspect she was. Mm -hmm. That probably contributed to it. And I got her in a very early range of motion program. And, uh, but, but this should have, my fixation should have been able to overcome that. And it was, uh, on the second go, but I think it was poor lateral fixation, to be honest with you, and should have selected this construct from the beginning because I wasn't able to get adequate purchase of fragments and I didn't need to go posterior because there wasn't a significant capitellar component. Any, um, and I'd, I'd ask you what you think. Uh, yeah, I think this, um, the, the revision is uh, definitely much more robust. I think when you have um, patients, you know, and I'll present a case too. Um, when you have patients at a certain age and their bone quality is really bad, a uh, couple things. Yeah. Number one is you're just going to have to just, you know, load, load up the screw. I think, I think getting screw into digitation where you're actually fighting to get the screws across because they're just basically hitting each other and those screws are really interdigitating. That is a, uh, a huge help when you have this type of bone and it gives you much more stability. Um, and it's, it's used in different areas of the body too, in fixing these uh, uh, osteoporotic fractures. So I think what you did here was 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 good. Um, and I think and I think also you um, um, I forgot on the other side. Of you, I think your posterior lateral plate may have been a touch short. I think you needed more of a robust plate, uh, not only for screw length below and above as well. So you needed the whole entire system to be much more. Um, um, uh, sturdy. 
Right. So I, I present this specifically for that mea culpa. You know, how would I do it? And hopefully to learn something. And then I would also point out as another self-criticism, I do, do try to pay attention to the olecranon fossa to allow for mm -hmm. motion. So the screw trajectory on these did allow me adequate motion. But if you look at this critically, you can see one of the screws is in the olecranon fossa and could have impinged. But I had the luxury of being able to look at that and chose not to shorten up that screw because it didn't really significantly impair my motion, just luckily. Um, so. So Mike, uh, how, so gonna, how long did, did you immobilize the patient initially after the first surgery? So I kept her immobilized about two to three weeks. Um, but I did give her then, a- Do you use a brace afterwards? I did use a brace afterward. So I will often give them a posterior splint for rest and for, for um, any activities where they're not moving it and then transition over to a range of motion brace to eliminate uh, varus valgus stress and allow them to lock it out. But I, I was worried about her degree of stiffness and, I, uh, and my second go around, I will admit that I um, was less worried about stiffness than healing and was much more restrictive. I got her moving at three weeks, but I was very restrictive, only with guidance, only with, you know, uh, the help of the therapist and uh, at home kept her, um, kept her immobilized at rest for another three weeks.